Hello, Tanse et Lanate Ani. Bonjour. Welcome back to our shared politics. My name is Nova. I am a settler on Turtle Island. I created this podcast with the hope of highlighting our similarities amongst political partners instead of focusing on the differences and pushing people further apart. I wish to express acknowledgement that I am on Treaty 8 territory, home to the Tetsukane, Deneza, Nahiawak, Soto, and BC, BC Métis. It is essential I recognize all First Nations, Métis, and Inui, both status and non-status, as the guardians of these lands. As a non-Indigenous person, I play a role as a treaty partner, being represented by the government. My pronouns are she, her, but I also accept they, them and I fall under the 2S LGBTQIA plus umbrella. So, as I teased in my intro, although I'm not sure if it's much of a tease since it's a history lesson, I'm going to give you a rundown of Canadian history on a chronological timeline broken up into a few episodes. In this episode, I'll begin with pre-colonization, including some regions of Turtle Island and the people who inhabited it, before briefly touching on the history of New France, going over Upper and Lower Canada, and ending with the Confederation in 1867. Let's jump in. Indigenous people began calling Turtle Island home some 30,000 years ago. By the time of European contact, there were many different peoples and nations, including the Mi'kmaq, primarily in the Maritimes, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee, primarily in the Great Lakes region, Nahiawak peoples, primarily in the prairies, Dene peoples further northwest, and Sowetmuk in the interior of BC. Tlingit and Haida peoples on northern and southern islands, respectively, of the west coast. And last but not least, Inuit peoples, primarily in subarctic regions. This is not a comprehensive list in the slightest, but a simplification of the regions and nations for our purposes today. European contact was first officially documented by French colonizers. Jacques Cartier planted a cross in 1534 and claimed the already fully inhabited land in the name of Francis I of France and later named the land Canada. The word, the word comes from the indigenous word Canada, which means village. There was a myth that Cartier misunderstood what Canada meant and thought it was what the indigenous people called their land. However, his earliest name for the wider territory was Pays de Canada, or Land of Canada's. Later, by the 18th century, when a further, further four colonies were established, the territory as a whole became known as New France, and Canada was simply the most colonized and split into further districts known as Quebec, Trois-Rivières, and Montreal. All initial permanent settlement attempts failed and the French were only able to make trade alliances and establish fishing settlements. In 1604, the fur trade officially began and a cartographer named Samuel de Champlain swiftly carried out an exploration of what would become New France. Pre-colonization, women paid an played an important role in indigenous society. Women controlled much of the politics and were the main property holders. The home belonged to the woman, thus she controlled the economy. Men appreciated women for their spiritual and mental strengths. When, we, when European men first made contact, they were surprised by the way the women conducted themselves. One early fur trader stated, I dreaded the sight of a woman, for whenever any were present, they were sure to preside over and direct all commercial transactions, and, and as often as that was the case, I was obliged to pay three times the price for what in their absence I could have procure, procured for one-third the value. Beginning in the 17th century, the word Métis was originally used by those in the Canadian fur trade and by colonizers in general to refer to people of mixed French father and indigenous mother parentage. Métis comes from the French verb métisser, which means to mix. 
As French, or sorry, as English and Scottish colonizers came to Canada, it saw the shift from the French to all European fathers. In eastern Canada, the mothers were usually Oma Min Miniwag and Anishinaabe, and in western Canada, they were usually Nehiwak, Anishinaabe, and Nakoda. While people of Métis heritage are found across Canada, the traditional homeland is usually seen as the prairie provinces, with the most well-known group being the Red River Métis along the Red River of the North in Manitoba. At first, the Hudson's Bay Company officially forbade these relationships. However, many indigenous people encouraged them because they drew fur traders into their kinship circles, created social ties that supported economic relationships. When indigenous women married European men, they introduced them to their culture and people, taught them about the land and its resources, and worked alongside them. Indigenous women made and patched clothing out of hide, could create snowshoes, dry fish, snare rabbits, skin animals, and paddled, steered, and helped in the manufacturing of canoes. Without these relationships, the fur trade would have never prospered. The children of these marriages were usually introduced to Catholicism, Catholicism, but grew up close to or in their indigenous communities. Now this all sounds nice until we look to historian records and not Canadian textbooks. The Métis culture actually developed over two or three generations. In the first, the European father, being an employee of the fur trade, would stay only for the season with the indigenous community and make a marriage à la façon du pays, or country marriage, with a high-status indigenous woman and have children. A country marriage meant that European fur traders would marry indigenous women by indigenous customs because Catholic priests would not recognize this union. The fur traders took these marriages seriously, as did, these, as did the indigenous families. A dowry was paid to the bride's family. Often the agreement was a horse. However, one colonizer stated that he was required to pay his bride's family 15 guns and 15 blankets, along with other items. The mother and children would move within the vicinity of a trading fort, becoming, quote, house Indians, unquote, as they were known to the company men, with the children often being employees of the company after adulthood. The grandchildren are seen by some historians as the first true generation with Métis culture as we know it today, due to the fact that by then, both parents were likely Métis through their shared culture and language. It's evident that the benefits from these relationships were one-sided, favoring the colonizers as usual. Indigenous women in these relationships had much higher birth rates than their peers who married Indigenous men for different reasons. One being the difference in lifestyles, nomadic versus settled. Another being the length of breastfeeding time, which can inhibit ovulation. And a darker, yet much more probable reason is because European men gained sexual and domestic rights over their wives when they wed. Marital rape was not recognized, and women were second-class citizens. Eventually, indigenous communities began discouraging their women from forming these relationships due to their higher exposure to disease, the burden of having many children close together in age, and a rise in cultural differences over who had control in raising the child. By mid-1629, the Anglo-French War was ending, and the French had surrendered Quebec to the British. The French and British ended up signing peace treaties and divvying up the land as they saw fit. The French did not focus primarily on colonization, but the little arrivals they had were farmers who had considerably higher birth rates. This is said to have been due to, quote, Canadians having an exceptional diet for their time with the natural abundance of meat, fish, and pure water. The good food conservation conditions during the winter and an adequate wheat supply most years, unquote. Yet, there is somehow no mention to the fact that colonizers would have none of those resources or essentials without the indigenous people who graciously taught them not only how to survive, but thrive. The increased French birth rates and population weren't simply due to the exceptional diet, however, but were also sped along by the Fille du Roi program between 1663 and 1673 when approximately 800 French teenage girls and young women were paid by King Louis XIV to go to New France. The majority of the filles du roi were between the ages of 12 to 25. Many were orphaned, 
and all were very poor with terribly low literacy rates. The time that the Fiduhua took to find a husband varied, most likely due to age. Some were married within months of arrival, while others took up to three years. Younger girls would have been much more susceptible to any marriage request and would have likely pr been likely preyed upon the moment they stepped foot in the New France. An early problem not foreseen was that the first groups of girls who were recruited were mostly town girls who did not know how to do hard, manual farm labor and were not accustomed to these tasks. In later years, rural girls were recruited in higher amounts. The program overall was an astounding success for the French crown. By 1670, most of the girls who had arrived the previous year were already pregnant, and by 1671, almost 700 children had been born to the Fille du Roi since 1663. By the end of 1671, the French colonial administrator in charge of New France advised the king that the colony was expected to gain self-sufficient population growth and would not need any more girls. From 1670 on, the British-owned Hudson's Bay Company was granted a commercial monopoly over the entire Hudson Bay drainage basin fur trade just north of the St. Lawrence River, known then as Rupert's Land. Rupert's Land covered what is now present-day northern Quebec and Ontario, all of Manitoba, and parts of Nunavut, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. The only reason the British were able to do this was because two coureurs de bois had learned from the Nehiawak that the best fur country lay further northwest than the French had explored yet and began to seek permission and support to set up a trading post. However, the French governor was worried that exploration would take away focus from the St. Lawrence River fur trade and refused to grant the men permission to scout the distant territory. Despite the refusal, the men set out for the basin regardless. A year later, they returned with premium furs as evidence of the potential in the region. However, they were arrested for trading without a license and their furs were confiscated. These traders decided to turn to the British to fund their explorations and trading in the new territory. They were able to gain the sponsorship of Prince Rupert and were given ships and finances. By the beginning of the 1700s, New France colonizers were well established along the shores of the St. Lawrence River in Quebec as well as Nova Scotia with a population of 16,000 compared to the 1666 census of 3,500. However, French arrivals became more and more infrequent again, so by the 1750s, after nearly a hundred years of the Hudson's Bay Company, the British settlers in the Maritimes and the 13 colonies outnumbered the French 10 to 1. During the Seven Years' War, from 1755 to 1763, the British had captured Nova Scotia, home of the Acadians, and ordered their expulsion to French Louisiana. The Acadians, who were not expelled back to various French territories, including France itself, were put into forced labor or servitude in British colonies. British colonial officers suspected that Acadians were aligned with France because some fought along the French troops. Though most Acadians had actually remained neutral during the war, the British carried out the Great Expulsion regardless. They forcefully deported 11,500 Acadians from the Maritimes, with approximately one-third dying from disease and drowning. In retrospect, it was most likely the first targeted ethnic cleansing in Canadian history. Toward the end of the Seven Years' War, Spain gained control of French Louisiana, becoming a province of New Spain. Due to this new control of the territory, Spain secretly hired agents to seek out displaced Acadians in France and sail them to Spanish Louisiana as a way to populate their new colony with Catholic farmers. These new arrivals from France joined the earlier wave expelled directly from Acadia and eventually settled into or alongside the existing Louisiana Creole settlements, intermarrying and gradually developed into what is now known as Cajun culture. After New France was defeated in 1763, France renounced its claims to the territory except for fishing rights off Newfoundland and two small islands where fishermen could dry their catches. These islands, Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, are still the property of France to this day, meaning Canadians can actually visit France just, just 19 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland without a passport. With the British Quebec Act of 1774, French-speaking habitants were reinstated most of their property, religious, and social culture, guaranteeing the right of Canadians to practice Catholicism and speak French. 
at this point, I'm going to shift towards exactly a little bit what was going on with the fur trade. In 1775, the importance of alcohol to the fur trade was highlighted when the HBC had a shortage of brandy, which hampered trade at the post. An HBC trader reported that, quote, although they had trading goods available, the Indians would not trade without brandy, unquote. The giving of alcohol began during ceremonies without before trading. The indigenous custom was to give gifts prior to the actual trade, and the Europeans were expected to participate. The traders found that intoxication made their indigenous partners less aware of what they were doing and more easily swindled. Let's remember here that indigenous folks had only used alcohol prior to this for ceremonies, of which was fermented wild plants, used with the expectation of self-improvement, and that brandy was first distilled in 1313. The colonizers knew exactly what they were doing and what the effects would be. The Northwest Fur Trade Company, which was the HBC's main rival, their traders gave the indigenous people potent cocktails called high wine, made of a mixture of brandy, dark rum, sherry, cloves, nutmeg, and cinnamon, watered down according to circumstances, which I think means that they received watered down alcohol depending on the quality of the furs that they received. The traders reported, once addicted, the Indians would do virtually anything to get more, including trap the animals to extinction. Historians have said that liquor soon supplanted other goods in desirability and became the most important single item in the trade. On top of this, the fur traders who introduced alcohol to the indigenous were not elite Europeans who would simply sip a glass of wine at dinner, but men who drank to get drunk. And this is the style of drinking that was first passed on to their trading partners. Please just remember this in later episodes when we discuss the signing of treaties, that the colonizers systematically created alcohol dependency where there never had been any before. During the American Revolution... The British evacuated New York City in 1783 and took so many loyalists to Canada that a whole separate colony, New Brunswick, was created. In 1791, the colony of Quebec was divided into the largely Francophone Lower Canada and the Anglophone Loyalist Upper Canada. Upper Canada and Lower Canada are misnomers, however, when you look at a map. The prefixes derive from their geographic positions on the St. Lawrence River, French Lower Canada was based further downriver from the headwaters and out towards the Maritimes, whereas English Upper Canada was above the Great Lakes. In 1814, the Pemmican Proclamation was issued to the Métis in the Red River area to stop them from exporting pemmican. Pemmican is a calorie-rich traditional indigenous staple made of tallow, dried meat, and wild berries. There's like 2,000 calories per pound of pemmican, and because of this, it's a huge resource during the fur trade. Without the indigenous people's pemmican, the colonizer once again would not have survived. The Métis people saw the value of pemmican and decided to trade it like fur. However, they traded with everyone, which the Hudson's Bay Company did not appreciate. The HBC wanted to starve out the other traders, so they could have full access to the land with no competition. And when the Métis refused, the governor banned all pemmican exports. In 1837, rebellions against the British colonial government took place in both Upper and Lower Canada. A report was made by a British statesman who had been sent to assess the situation, stating he strongly recommended a government responsible to the country rather than the monarchy, as well as the amalgamation of the Canadas for the deliberate assimilation of the Francophone population. The Canadas were merged into a single colony, the United Province of Canada, by the 1840 Act of Union, and the responsible government was achieved in 1848. The initial provinces were Canada West, which is now Ontario, Canada East, which is now Quebec, and three maritime provinces, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI. At the time, Canada West and Canada East were given the same number of seats in Parliament, even though the East population was at the time significantly larger, some 670,000 compared to 480,000. Canada East was therefore underrepresented on the political stage. Newfoundland was still a British colony and was not included in the Act of Union. In 1864, a conference was held between the provincial delegates to discuss a proposed Canadian confederation. 
The major source of conflict was between those who favored a more encompassing federal system and those who favored stronger provincial rights. Representatives from the Maritimes and Canada East argued for provincial rights as they feared they would lose their cultural identity. However, Canada West's leader was John A. Macdonald, and we all know how he loves to steal cultural identity. He must have really dug his fucking heels in too somehow because they came to a compromise between a federal parliament and provincial legislatures. The delegates also decided on a elected lower house, the House of Commons, and an appointed upper house, the Senate of Canada, although there was, of course, much debate about how many senators each province would have. Overall, the result was a compromise. Each province gained its own legislature, and the power of government was divided up between the federal and provincial governments. However, the federal government was given considerable power over the provinces. It was decided the federal government would be placed in Ottawa, and that the House of Commons would be based on population, and the Senate of Canada is reflective of regional representation. This means that the three regions of Canada... Ontario, Quebec, Maritimes would each have 24 seats in the Senate for a total of 72 in total. The House of Commons had 181 seats distributed amongst the provinces as follows. 82 for Ontario, 65 for Quebec, 19 for Nova Scotia, and 15 for New Brunswick, as PEI decided not to join the newly unified Canada at that time. Although the conference changed the political sphere of Canada considerably, the British maintained its position as the head of government. I would also like to know why Ontario got more seats than Quebec when when Canada East had a larger population. Is that not like... 670,000 in Canada East compared to 480,000 in Canada West. But somehow Canada West got 82 seats and Canada East got 65. I don't. That's Johnny McDonald for you. He's a magician. The British North America Act received royal acceptance by Queen Victoria and on July 1st, 1867, the Dominion of Canada was formed. Although only Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick initially chose to be included in the new Dominion of Canada, the Constitution Act of 1867 made provisions for the inclusion of Newfoundland, PEI, BC, Rupert's Land, and the Northwestern Territory at a later date. On that very first Dominion Day in 1867, there were already at least seven church-run residential schools opened in various regions. The Governor General appointed John A. Macdonald as Canada's first Prime Minister and set us on the path to a massive, federally funded residential school complex and generational trauma. As always, thank you for joining me today. I drop a new episode every mon- Monday morning at midnight on Mountain Standard Time, so check back in next week to see what I'll be sharing with you then. If you or a loved one you know uses drugs, please keep in mind that you can call 888-688-6677 to contact the National Overdose Response Services to access support while using and especially using alone. And there's the Brave app with a use alone timer that connects you to a paramedic if you don't respond. Everyone, please consider picking up a free naloxone kit and keep it on hand 24-7. If you're unaware of where you can pick up a kit, simply Google Naloxone Kit plus your province. I've got one in my purse somewhere, which I don't actually ever take anywhere because I don't carry a purse. I should rightfully put it into my car glove box or something. Um, And I'm not sure if they expire, actually. But yeah, you can pick up free ones across Canada. Usually from your local pharmacy, but you can always give it a check to make sure. If you learned something new today, it'd be awesome if you'd click that button and follow along for next time. Or if you'd like to contact me with feedback, you can email me at oursharedpodcast at gmail.com. See you next time.